Uh, well, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, I think that this conference, this meeting, and it's the very first one, uh, is a symbol of uh, what I think is going to be a, a revolution. This uh, word revolution is kind of overused. Uh, so I'll give you my definition of a revolution. A revolution is an event, a technology, that impacts a lot of people uh, over a long period of time. We use that word uh, much too freely uh, of late. Uh, the brain revolution hasn't yet started, but there are a lot of symptoms around that tell you that something is about to happen. Uh, it, I, I can tell you about uh, how it's impacted me, uh, and of course that's my favorite topic, me. <laughs> so uh, I, I first started really get interested in, in the uh, brain uh, in the context of uh, medicine, uh, because I have a cousin who is doing brain research uh, and has discovered ways of injecting, of all things, caffeine into parts of the brain uh, to manage pain. Uh, more recently, I got interested in the fact that all these computers and other tools that we have available today uh, are uh, only being used to a very small uh, part of their potential because we have problems interacting with them. And then I attended the uh, Consumer Electronics Show uh, in January of this year, uh, and I put on a headset that had a bunch of sensors on it, uh, and I had the opportunity to use my mind to control a race car. And this is a commercial product that's being sold today. And what they did was somehow or other, they can, uh, uh, I uh, calibrated this thing fortunately to only two levels. One was uh, quiet mind, which for me is really difficult, but I've been working on meditation, so I calibrated quiet. The easy part was the excited part. And uh, so uh, they set me up here and I went into my meditation and this race car just sat there and then they said, go. And I just got excited and this race car just took off. And I was competing with the guy that invented this device. And his race car just sat there. <laughs> so I ran the race, and it turns out the reason I won is because he forgot to turn his race car on. <laughs> but uh, so I was, uh, this was, uh, it gave me an indication of the fact that something is starting to happen. Because this device not only could do, do a binary thing, like turn a race car on and off, but apparently, they, with training, you could control 12 levels uh, of uh, whatever. So we, uh, what I see there is a window into a dream that I've had for a long time. Uh, here we have the power of computers that have the processing capability of the human mind, uh, and yet they are so isolated from us. Why? Because the only way we can control them uh, is through a keyboard, T terrible, and, and I've never learned how to, to type myself. The prospect of being able to use a computer as an extension of the mind to do the things that we don't do very well, like we don't remember things very well, and, and relieve us of those kinds of problems so we can do what the human mind really can do, which is uh, abstract. So I've observed that not only is this thing having impact on me, but all of a sudden I start reading about things that are happening in the rest of the world. You know about CalBrain, you know about the uh, Obama's Brain uh, Initiative. Uh, I read in the New York Times that of all things, the Freudian psychotherapists are getting interested in brain research because uh, as you know, with, with uh, psychotherapy, uh, you lie on a couch, uh, the uh, doctor talks to you for a long time, uh, and after a, after a couple of years, uh, they make a decision either you're cured or you're not cured. And these people finally are realizing that if they can measure things in the brain during their process, perhaps they can correlate those things with the health of an individual. So here we have practical applications. It's taken a long time, I have to tell you, 
because uh, I've, done, I've really got an education since Ralph invited me to come here. Uh, uh, my, the first part of my education, of course, is talking to Ralph and Nick Spitzer and Sadiq, who uh, have uh, worked very hard to uh, uh, educate a dumb engineer about the complexities uh, of the brain. But uh, in looking at the history, we really have understood the fundamental uh, technology of the brain for a long time. In the 1930s, they knew about neurons, axons, dendrites, synapses. 1930, think about that, 85 years ago, and when Ralph mentioned technology today, you know technology has to do with human beings, with, with how uh, the science can affect the lives of human beings. Well, we haven't quite got there with brain research after 85 years. I happened to pick up a book that was written, uh, actually a, a lecture that was uh, written up by a fellow named uh, John von Neumann. If you're in the computer business, you know that he was the pioneer of computer architecture. And he wrote a book called uh, The Brain uh, and the Computer. And it was brilliant. He talked about uh, everything that was known in the 1950s about the brain, and it was a great deal. They had gone on beyond understanding the elements of the brain to understand how fast signals move through the brain. He made this comparison between the brain and it's amazing, you can use the same words to describe the brain as you do a computer. You know, the digital versus the analog, uh, networking, all of the same expressions. And his final conclusion was there's absolutely no correlation between a, the way a brain works uh, and the way uh, a computer works. 1956, so here we are in, uh, what year is this? 2015, 85 years after the beginnings of this thing, and we seem not to have made much progress. And one of the manifestations of that is whenever you talk to a brain expert, what's the first thing they tell you? Do you know that you have 10th to the 11th neurons in your head? I mean, I can't think of anything more useless than to know the number of neuron, <laughs> neurons in, in your head. On the other hand, at the beginning, I got captured into this and I figured, you know, I ought to make a contribution to the science of brain technology. So I calculated, now this is going to be really important, Ralph. If you took all of the axons in your brain and put them end to end, did you realize that that turns out to be uh, 100,000 kilometers? Seriously. I, mean, I, I should have brought that up because I think a bunch of you brain experts are now thinking about how they could check up on my number. But, it, but it's uh, really true that you could, the axons in your brain will, can circle the Earth three times. Amazing uh, physical complexity. But all of that has no meaning unless ultimately we can understand what, uh, what that means to us as people. So I think this group has an extraordinary opportunity, and I want to uh, address the people in the group that are, in a, and I think it's almost everybody in the academic community that are in the range of maybe 20 to 40 years, and uh, give you a comparison with uh, what happened in my career, because I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world. I think I was born just at the right time uh, for, for the industry that I got involved in. Because when I was born, radio had just been invented. I didn't want to really tell you how old I was that. So. Uh, and I have lived through that period to see a whole bunch of true revolutions. And it takes a long time. There are really three phases to, to the creation of any uh, technology. The first is the basic research where people are trying to understand the, the nature of things. Uh, and that can take a short time or a long time, uh, but usually a very long time. The next two phases uh, are much more understandable. The first one uh, is the uh, going from the time that somebody has theorized and demonstrated something in the laboratory to when they can create the first product 
the first thing that does something useful for people. I, I wonder if you would, uh, I know you're all paying attention. Take something like the microwave oven. How long do you think it took from the time the first microwave oven was introduced to the time when your neighbor had one? Anybody want to take a wild guess? How long? Well, you know, I can always tell how intelligent my <laughs> audience is by what answer they say there, because most people would say, oh, it, it, two or three years. It turns out that for almost any product you look at, from the time the product is introduced to when it's commonly used, averages something close to 20 years. So it turns out that from the time you demonstrate something in a laboratory to first product, generally about 20 years which is just about a generation. From the time the product is introduced to when your neighbor has one, another generation. So if you really want to witness a revolution, you have to be there at the very beginning when you're young, and then two generations later, you get to see the end. Uh, and I was really lucky enough to be able to do that uh, for uh, the uh, cell phone. Uh, and by the way, that hasn't stopped yet. I hope to be around for at least one more generation. But those of you here that are just starting out in this research have the opportunity to be here when the brain revolution really happens. And it is going to happen. We are not only going to understand the brain well enough to cure diseases, to correct injuries, but we will be able to do things to fulfill the dream that I've had, and that is to be able to think about something and have the uh, computer actually perform the functions that you don't do very well. Interact with the computer, have the computer be an asset, a part of you, uh, without you even having to think about it. Because that's my definition of good technology. Good technology uh, is invisible. It's there helping you uh, when you need it. Uh, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to do anything. It's just there. But just think of the power of the human mind when it's accessorized by a computer. The worst example uh, of a machine uh, interacting with human beings is a cell phone. I'm sure everybody here uses uh, smartphones. Anybody here that doesn't have a smartphone? There's, there's, always, there's always somebody trying to make a statement. Because <laughs> I think that uh, uh, cell phones, uh, com uh, personal computers in general, uh, are very poor examples of technology. Because they all try to turn us into engineers so, uh, who understand what to do, and have to learn something, and that's a really poor technology. The best technology is invisible. It's there, it helps you, it's your slave, uh, and you are unaware of it. It's still a good technology uh, if, in fact, it's transparent. You know it's there. Uh, you may have to do something to make it happen, but it's, uh, you don't have to really think about it very much. Adequate technology is intuitive. You have to do things, but on the other hand, uh, the, uh, uh, you don't have to really learn anything. And the cell phone is f so far from that uh, that it's, uh, but that problem is going to get solved. And one of the ways that it's going to get solved is we're going to learn how to interface uh, the human mind with, uh, uh, with our machines. So. That's my story. I think we are uh, at the onset uh, of a revolution. And the vision is very clear. The vision is that we are going to be able to cure disease. We are going to be, repair, be able to repair people's bodies using the brain, because we know the brain interacts with everything uh, in the human body. We are going to be able to interact with machines uh, and use these machines as an extension of the human body without the interference uh, of uh, 
things like the uh, keyboard will be able to interact directly with these things. So the vision is very clear. What's left is the passion, the ability to stick with it for multiple generations. I think that you have that opportunity. Now, you don't have to wait for two generations for this uh, revolution to happen. There will be lots of intermediate victories, and those are the things that keep the passion alive. But the reason that you have to be passionate, you have to be excited about what you're doing is that there are gonna be lots and lots of failures. One of the thing, lucky things that happened to me uh, in my career is that I started with a company uh, called Motorola, which is very different than the Motorola that uh, uh, still remains today. And the founder of Motorola established a principle that somehow infused itself throughout our company uh, and it became part of me. And he expressed that with the words, reach out, do not fear failure. Because the reality is if you're doing something really important and what you are doing is important and will be increasingly important, when you do those things, you are taking risks. There will be many, many failures. And without those failures, you know you didn't take the risk in the first place. So there will be failures. Fortunately, there are going to be a lot of victories in the way, uh, along the way. But the long-term result is going to be a, a revolution. And when that revolution happens, I hope you remember that Marty told you about it <laughs> first. Thank you very much.